Hello everyone, my name is Reverend Terry Swan and I'm the senior pastor here at Salem. We're so glad that you joined us for online worship today. If you will, take a moment to fill out our online connect card. You can find that in the comment section of Facebook or YouTube or go to our Salem app. It's so important to stay connected at this time in our community and so tell us how we can pray for you. Also take a moment to sign up for our social media. Find a connect group in which you can connect with God and each other. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, wash over us your spirit today. May we be met by you. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me Oh, thank you, Jesus Worthy of every song we could ever sing You are worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you, Jesus, yeah Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, yeah. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. 
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you So we cried holy There is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show In my life, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And I thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you for the activity of our limbs and the breath in our lungs. We thank you for the opportunity to just express every inch of ourselves that you have given us. And we pray that it is acceptable in your sight. We pray all these things through your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. The scripture passage this morning is from the fifth chapter of Paul's first letter, of the, to the Church of Thessalonia, and it is titled, Final Instructions. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you and who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Good morning, church. I'm Deborah Lemoyne, the executive pastor here at Salem. One of the many things I love about my job is that I don't have to spend a lot of time in front of the camera, but I am excited to preach today because I bring good news. For those of you that have said you are done with 2020 and just wanted to end, I am here to say congratulations. You have made it through. And no, I haven't been working from home alone reading spreadsheets for so long that I lost track of time. The good news is true. For those of us that lean into the liturgical rhythms of the church calendar, this is the end of the year. Next week is the first Sunday of Advent, the four weeks of the church year when we prepare for Christmas, the glorious birth of the baby Jesus in a stable in Bethlehem. That is the first week of the new year for the church. And if we pull this camera out to a wider angle, you'd find that the church is already decorated. The trees have been delivered and anchored out front. The candles are in the windows. And if you listen closely, you'll hear the sound of men on a lift stringing lights all the way to the top of the steeple this year. 
I hope you'll join us Friday night when we flip the switch and turn them all on, lighting up the church for Christmas. But not today. Because today is the last Sunday of the old year, not the first Sunday of the new one. And often, in order to begin a new year well, we first have to stop and pay some attention to how we end the old one. That seems harder in a year like 2020 when we just want it to end. But as Christians in this country, we have a particular advantage. The church calendar most years, including this one, ends the great week of Thanksgiving, an American holiday. Now I want to acknowledge right up front that the classic American story about pilgrims introducing Native Americans to Thanksgiving over a happy dinner of turkey and pumpkin pie fails to tell a wholly accurate version of a sadly troubled chapter of our past. In fact, the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian explains that the New England tribes already had autumn harvest feasts of Thanksgiving long before the pilgrims arrived. And that for them, each day is a day of thanksgiving to the Creator. That's the great spiritual aspect of the holiday, shared across cultures, that I want to talk about today. And it's simply this. We are all called to stop occasionally and give thanks. We give thanks for all the good things we got this year that we didn't actually earn. We give thanks for all the blessings we received that we didn't necessarily deserve. We give thanks for the gifts that came our way. Things that weren't payments for work performed or transactions negotiated, but gifts, totally unmerited. In Christianity, we call this grace, an unmerited gift freely given. It's why we sometimes talk about saying grace, not just prayers before the Thanksgiving meal. When I was a kid, we spent Thanksgiving at my grandparents with our cousins. My grandma, Frances, made the best biscuits you will ever have in your life. The taste and the smell of them lingers in my memory as the bar against which every biscuit I bake today is measured. She served them with fresh farm butter and homemade pear jam. Jam so rich we called it pear honey. And she cooked it each fall with pears she picked herself from the tree down the road. Those biscuits were better than pie. But if you tried to sneak one off the counter before mealtime, my grandma would smack your hand with damp dish towels she always seemed to have at the ready. And she'd say firmly, no eating till we say grace. But when the time was right and everything was finally ready, she would call to my Uncle Glenn, the pastor in the family, and she would tell him it was time to say grace. Then we'd all gather around the table and hold hands, and Glenn would thank God for the blessings our family had received that year. I learned more about grace around that table than I learned in seminary. Maybe it was a farm family thing. Farmers know the cycles of crops. They acknowledge their dependence on God and weather. They work hard, but they know that a good harvest depends on more than just their own hard work. That's grace. Some of the people I loved most in that chapter of life are gone now. I'm grateful for the way they shaped my life. But some of the people I love best in this chapter, I hadn't even dreamed of yet. My husband, my kids, and I'm grateful for them. We live our lives in chapters. And the passage of seasons and years and time, it's not an enemy, it's an opportunity. We end the year with gratitude so we can begin the new one with grace. Thanksgiving comes before Christmas for a reason. It seems especially poignant this year as we hear so much talk about our need to find a new normal in 2021. I've said it myself many times, but I was challenged recently to reevaluate that language. Joe Park, a church financial consultant we've worked with often during the pandemic, said recently that we need to be working towards the next normal. And it struck me that there was an important difference in the language he used. When we talk about an old normal ending in 2020 and a new normal beginning in 2021, we imply that those are the only two versions of normal we will ever know. And of course that's not true. We're always moving from one normal to the next. And every normal can actually be a better normal. It's a new opportunity, a time to take inventory and decide what we want to take with us from the last version of normal, what we're better off leaving behind. It's a chance to evaluate who we're called to be and what we're called to do in the next normal that we maybe just weren't quite ready for in the last one. 
It's a fresh chance to make the world look a little more like the kingdom of God that Jesus talks so often about. Jesus often explains what this kingdom looks like by telling stories about meals that make a lot of sense at Thanksgiving. Stories about fruit and yeast and wine and bread broken among friends. But when a lawyer challenges him directly, Jesus, what do we actually need to do? Jesus answers very clearly. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is what we're called to do, and gratitude helps us get it done. How? Pope Francis shared a story publicly that he heard from a priest during the pandemic. A young child approached him and said, Father, this is my savings. It's just a little. It's for those who are in need today because of the pandemic. Pope Francis explained it's something small, but it's something big. It is a contagious gratitude that helps every one of us to be grateful toward those who take care of our needs. Gratitude, said the Pope, is both a sign of good manners and a key characteristic of a Christian. It is a simple but genuine sign of the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of gratuitous and grateful love. I may not agree with everything the Pope says. Truth be told, I probably don't agree with everything anyone says, but I love his language here. And the truth is Pope Francis and my grandma Francis were saying the exact same thing. We stop to say grace before we eat a Thanksgiving biscuit or serve communion through a car window or end the church year, not just because it's good manners, but because it's who we are called to be. It's how we both recognize and contribute to the kingdom of God, which is in fact the kingdom of gratuitous and grateful love. To do this, we have to develop practices that help us to recognize and acknowledge the good gifts that come from God. Developing these habits can help us become more thankful. And the most obvious practice is simply to practice. We have to make a habit of expressing gratitude. Give thanks in all circumstances, Paul's final instructions to the Thessalonians said. Thankfulness rather than complaint should be our default position. It seems like complaint is the love language of the pandemic, and doom scrolling became a national pastime this election cycle. But constantly looking for the bad orients us in the wrong direction. When you see something good in your life, point it out. Thank God for it. We all complain occasionally, probably too often, but we need to practice responding to our own complaining by finding things to be grateful for. This helps to rewire our brains to be as proficient at recognizing the good in life as we are at identifying the bad. We need to express gratitude regardless of the situation. In his aptly titled Final Instructions, Paul goes on to tell the Thessalonians to give thanks in all circumstances because God wills it. Why would God will this? Because when we hold on to faith and work with God in all things, God will use all things for good. My favorite one-liner in all of scripture says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those that love him. And he calls us to work alongside him. That doesn't mean things always feel good. It doesn't mean that all things are good. It doesn't mean that God makes bad things happen just to teach us a good lesson. But it does mean we can have confidence that ultimately, somewhere, somehow, in the next normal or the one after that, God will use all things for good. Perhaps Martin Luther King said it best when he acknowledged that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Our final instructions from Paul also tell us that we need to make gratitude a part of our interactions with other people. Gratitude should impact both our relationship with God and our relationships with each other. Say thank you to the people in your life, to those who work hard among us, to those who care for us, to those who admonish us to be better people. Too often, the people we express gratitude the least are the people that are closest to us. So when we gather in Thanksgiving, no matter how we do it this year, we need to thank God and we need to thank one another. Good manners in this case also equals great theology. It doesn't need to be complicated. Adam Hamilton told a group of large church pastors this fall that he was encouraging his congregation to pray on their fingers during the pandemic five times a day, once when they woke up, three times at meals, 
once when they go to bed at night. It made me think of those Thanksgiving turkeys we crafted as kids, where we traced our hands and colored them to look like turkeys. My nephew George made one for me to show you. George lives on a farm and he really knows what turkey feathers look like. He even labeled them for me, one through five, every morning, every meal, every evening when we go to bed. Stop and say grace, say thank you. Train yourself to find at least five things a day to be grateful for. Research tells us that if we do this every day, we'll see the world differently and our world will actually be different too because gratitude helps us shape what the next normal is going to look like. You see, we start by saying grace, but we go even further by doing it. That's why we called this sermon series, not Thanksgiving, but thanks doing. The Swiss moral philosopher, Henry Friedrich Emil, wrote long ago that thankfulness is just the beginning of gratitude. Gratitude is the completion of what thankfulness begins. Thankfulness may consist merely of words, Gratitude is shown in acts. Gratitude is shown in acts. I don't know if there has ever been a year when the church has proven this more. We haven't been able to gather together in person to say our traditional words of gratitude. So instead we spread out all around our community doing acts of gratitude, feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, protecting the vulnerable, spreading good news online, making music in new ways, saying thank you to doctors and nurses and essential workers who've cared for us, encouraging one another despite our social distance. Your giving, your doing, your acting out of gratitude changes lives. Thank you for being the church this year. I know we'll do it even better next year because we will do it together with God in love. And I can't wait to see what the next normal looks like. But before we go there, pause here at the end of a long year to give thanks. I know the Thanksgiving feast is gonna look a little less feast-like for many of us this year, but perhaps that's a good reminder that it's not really about the turkey or the pies or even the biscuits after all. It is about a kingdom of gratuitous and grateful love. It's about remembering, as those tribes taught us long ago, that each day is a day of thanksgiving to our Creator. So I will try to remember Paul's final instructions as I end this church year, and I encourage you to do the same. Acknowledge those who work hard to care for you. Live in peace, not disruption with each other. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. Strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. And perhaps most important, give thanks. Do thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving and happy birthday, Mom. November is a month when we take time to give thanks. But Salem, all throughout this year, you have been giving more than just thanks. You have been giving hope. 2020 brought about changes that created unfathomable hardships for food insecure children, families, and people experiencing homelessness in our community. In response, Salem focused our efforts on feeding the hungry. And because of your giving, our Haven Street Meal Ministry in South City has fed over 5,000 people. Salem has prepared and served over 3,000 meals for those in need at Epworth. We partnered with LifeWise STL to provide over $20,000 worth of food and essentials to families in need at their drive through food pantry. And when Freedom Schools couldn't have class this summer, we provided 7,000 meals to those students from a food truck at our South City site. Our Holy Smokers Men's Ministry cooked and served over 15,000 barbecue meals for hungry people in St. Louis. We collected and distributed over $5,000 worth of non-perishables through food drives, and we've done even more. But the need is only continuing to grow. Since the pandemic hit, our community Haven Street and Epworth have doubled their weekly distribution. LifeWise STL saw the need from their community triple. And each time, Salem has stepped up to help fill the need. As the number of people in need continues to grow, so must our loving action. We need your giving to be able to connect more people with God's extravagant love. Every time we provide food for the hungry, the response is always the same. Gratitude. The kids thank you, 
the parents thank you, the community says thank you. So thank you, church. But the need continues. And with your help, our work will continue as well.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today and for being a part of Salem's online community of faith. I pray that God has blessed you today through the spoken word and through the music. Salem is carrying on with important ministries, especially during these difficult times, but we need your help. We ask that you please get involved by participating in a connect group. We also ask that you pray for Salem's ministries as we work to share God's love and hope in our community. And finally, we ask that you give financial support to sustain the work we are doing. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for giving us ways to worship you, to show our love for you, and ways to share your saving grace with others. We thank you for those who work so hard to bring the good news to a desperate world. We pray that you will bless the work we do and use us to demonstrate your amazing love. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. <laughs>